Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to today's combustion webinar. And uh, this is Peng Zhao from the University of Tennessee. And it's my great pleasure to introduce you today's speaker, Professor Li Chao. And Professor Li Chao is a professor in the School of, Astro uh, of Aeronautics and Astronautics at P Purdue University. She also holds a courtesy appointment in the School of Mechanical Engineering. She earned bachelor and master degree in engineering mechanics from Tsinghua University in 1999 and 2001, and also a PhD in aerospace engineering from the University of Michigan in 2007. Her research has focused on the development of new technologies and the understanding of basic science in the areas of fuels, combustion, and sustainable energy. She's a recipient of the NSF Career Award AFOSR Young Investigator Award and the Army Research Office Young Investigator Award. Uh, all the three uh, you can imagine. And she's an associate fellow of AIAA and associate editor of AIAA Journal. She currently serves on the board of directors mm -hmm. of the Combustion Institute. So with that, let's welcome Pro Professor Chow and the podium is yours. Well, thank you very much Pan, for your kind introduction. Um, I would like to thank the organizing committee for inviting me uh, to give a webinar. I remember uh, when the pandemic just started March, 2020, um, we were stuck at home. We couldn't go to conference, couldn't travel. And Professor Yi Guangzhu and Professor Wen Ching San, they started uh, this webinar. And then quickly we have organizer committee members from all over the world. And then on every Saturday morning, 10 o'clock, and then we have uh, you know, a colleague in the community to share with us their research. So this has become something we look forward to uh, during the pandemic on Saturday morning. Uh, even though you know, things get better, um, the pandemic is not completely over yet, but I do appreciate this opportunity to, to connect with colleagues and to learn what other people are doing. So uh, this is really great. Um, so today I'd like to uh, talk uh, with you about a few, uh, uh, the work on pre-chamber turbulent jet, jet ignition for combustion engines that my group and our collaborators have been doing uh, in the past couple of years. Uh, before that, I would like to acknowledge my graduate students who participated in this research. Uh, Dr. Sanyang Biswas, who is a assistant professor at University of Minnesota, Twin Cities right now. And Dongen Li and Tian Xiaoyu are my current PhD uh, student. Um, the work is being sponsored by Caterpillar, Aramco, and Ford. Okay, all right. Um, Please allow me one minute to brag about Purdue, which I am obligated to do so. So uh, the Maris, uh, the Maris Zucro Laboratory, um, the largest academic proportion laboratory in the world, currently occupies a 24 acre uh, site at Jensen to Purdue Airport. So this is our airport. Uh, we do train lots of pilots and uh, aviation technicians at Purdue. Um, so the Zucco lab is basically operated by both uh, the aeronautics and astronautic, as well as mechanical engineering schools. Uh, the facility has test cells um, uh, with infrastru infrastructures that can perform real scale experiments that have attracted a lot of funding. As you see from these images, uh, the topics covers a lot of uh, different things, wide range from uh, compressors, high pressure combustion, to thermal sciences, fluid mechanics, in advanced laser diagnostics, to rotation detonation engines, rockets and gas turbine engines, and all the way to uh, energetic materials. All right, so back to uh, what I'm going to talk about today. I guess the first question is, um, many of the uh, colleagues in the field, in the community have been talking about what's the future of combustion engines. 
uh, there's no doubt that there is a um, energy transformation which is going on right now to address the challenge of global warming. Um, we have seen renewable energy, wind, solar, uh, geothermal, wave, they are basically emerging into the market um, that will help the community address the uh, challenge and also created jobs. Um, in terms of transportation, uh, we have seen a trend. This is unavoidable. This is a trend that's going on that is electrification. Uh, we see more and more electrical cars. That's why Tesla um, you know, stock price is rocket high right now. Um, but we have to also honestly believe that IC engine will not disappear overnight. So they will still uh, play a role in the global energy mix, at least for some time, a few decades. So here I'm showing you a, a data, the data from uh, US Energy Information Administration. So basically whatever scenario uh, that a conventional gas and engine will still occupy a certain market share by 2050. Right. Uh, and then there's also competition between hydrogen versus electric. And I don't know which one is going to win in the future. Um, um, most likely they will coexist. Right. Um, you know, electrical cars and obviously has a lot of advantages, you know, efficiency and scalability. That's definitely. But hydrogen cars also have some uh, hydrogen, you know, derived from renewable sources like uh, water electrolysis also have a lot of advantages. And especially in those applications where the energy density requirement is higher. Um, for hydrogen, there's also a competition between hydrogen combustion engine versus hydrogen fuel cell. Uh, well, yes, fuel cell has a higher efficiency, um, perhaps maximum 52 versus 48 for hydrogen internal combustion engines. But fuel cell has a high requirement on fuel uh, purity, right? Its tolerance to impurity is, uh, is not that uh, good. And also manufacturing at scale is a problem. The cost is high. So I guess my point is, you know, nobody knows exactly what's going to happen in the future, <clears throat> although we can see the trend, but most likely these different uh, energy technologies, low carbon technology will coexist, exist, and also depending on the country's economic resources and situations may be different. So let me talk about um, what is pre-chamber TJI. TJI means turbulent jet ignition. So here I'm going to play two movies uh, so you can clearly see what is pre-chamber turbulent jet ignition. So here you see this is a very typical spark plug that used in cars, right? So basically what happens, they generate a spark, a high temperature zone, which cause ignition and flame propagation. Now, pre-chamber ignition on the right. So basically, this is this, uh, it's a device basically very, you know, in terms of size configuration, very similar to a spark plug, except inside it, there's a hollow volume. Typically, this is a few cc, very small volume. And on top of it, there's a spark plug. So there's a spark plug inside it. Now, when this uh, the mixture in the pre-chamber is ignited, pressure increases, and you see that there's small holes. These holes typically have diameter one millimeter or even smaller. So this calls high speed jets coming out from these small nozzles, which, you know, basic in the form of turbulent jet, which penetrates into the main chamber cause ignition. So in this case, we have a pre-chamber, four nozzles, four jets that quickly penetrates into the main chamber cause ignition and burning. Uh, the bottom is a simulation by my colleagues at Ramco. So you can clearly see the difference between spark ignition versus pre-chamber ignition. So you might ask, what are the benefits of TJI? Well, first of all, because 
um, for IC engines that either ultra lean or highly EGR dilution conditions, uh, a challenge is how do we push the limit? Because when it's very lean or highly diluted, it's hard to ignite the mixture. Now, TDI has advantage because the ignition is not point ignition, rather it's distributed, it's multi-site, it's on the surface of these jets which cause reliable ignition and also faster flame propagation and potentially lower cycle to cycle variation and knock, mitigate knock. So the next question is, you know, pre-chamber TJI is not a new technology. It has been there for a few decades. What are the engines that use pre-chamber TJI? I want to give you a couple of examples. Now, most pre-chamber Jet ignition engines are those uh, very large born natural gas engines uh, for you know, electricity generation, for mining, uh, for power generation for those. Those are basic stationary power generation. So here, this is example of Caterpillar G3600 series. Uh, it has 12 piston. Uh, the maximum power is almost 3000 kilowatts. Now all these stationary natural gas engine operates at very, very lean condition, okay? The fuel equivalence ratio can be as low as 0.5. So it's a lean burn, which means we have a lot of excess air, which requires a very powerful compressor. Now, because it's lean burn, ultra lean burn, so there's typically no need for after treatment as the NOx level is very low. Uh, this is another example of GE Jambaka Type 4 um, uh, stationary uh, a natural gas engine for maximum 1500 kilowatts in power. Uh, another category of engines that use pre-chamber technology are super uh, sports cars. Uh, here is an image of the Masrali uh, MC2, uh, MC20 sports car which easily costs a quarter million that I cannot afford. Uh, but these F1 technology-based sports cars use pre-chamber technology. So basically in the cylinder, you see they have six to 12 jets uh, coming from the pre-chamber that penetrates into the main chamber for ignition and combustion. So here, um, pre-chamber ignition for <coughs> gasoline engines is new. Okay, so currently you see all the passenger cars on road and none of them uh, used uh, pre-chamber jet ignition. Um, so this is still at very early stage, exploration stage for gasoline engine. But the good news is that one of the OEM is putting pre-chamber in their cars. Um, uh, in a few years, we probably will see that passenger cars that use pre-chamber jet ignition. Um, so here I used a slide from my collaborator, Dr. Xing Yu at Aramco. Uh, we have started collaborating three years ago. Aramco is a pioneer in pre-chamber uh, jet ignition technology. So here on the bottom left, you see this is a, um, uh, a typical uh, a turbocharged SI engine efficiency map from a passenger vehicle over here. So you see as a function of engine speed and BMP, so indicating load. And then this is the brake thermal efficiency. Now there are, so here, if you look at the very dark red area, that's the highest efficiency. But this dash line below which we're gonna run into dilution tolerance issue. And here, this is a knock region. And then LSPI, that's the low speed pre-ignition which can take place at these extreme conditions. So there are a couple of challenges for us to further improve efficiency of, um, of gasoline engines, which include limited dilution tolerance at low and median load, and knock at median to high load, and LSPI at extreme conditions. So TDI can potentially help improve these challenges. As I mentioned earlier, because of the pattern of ignition, we can increase dilution tolerance. This includes both lean burn or high EGR uh, dilution, and also mitigating knock uh, because of fast and gas consumption and better target areas. Uh, Pre-chamber ignition have two types, um, passive and active. 
So here I have two uh, pictures. The left one is a passive pre-chamber. It's kind of like a, just a spark plug with adapter. And then on the bottom, you see where you can design this to have different geometry, volume, and you have different no number of nozzles, a diameter of nozzles, or location of the nozzles. But it, but the gas is, goes into the pre-chamber, which is here, is by intake and stroke compression. So as the name suggests, it's passive, okay? Now for active, which is on the right-hand side, it's an active pre-chamber, which means on top of here, you see there, this is the active injection line. Basically, we'll inject additional fuel into the pre-chamber. And we could also inject um, fuel air mixture. It depends. But basically, you have additional system to add more uh, fuel or fuel air mixture into the pre-chamber. This is what we call active pre-chamber. And obviously, the active pre-chamber will be more complex, but they give you some flexibility in terms of like like manip manipulate the mixture in the, in the pre-chamber to have uh, the kind of combustion you would like to have. Uh, in general, pre-chamber volume is very small. It's between one to 5% clearance volume. Um, for gasoline engines, it's around 1%. For the large bore natural gas engines, it could go as high as 5%. And then these nozzles are very small. Typically, the smallest I've seen is like half millimeter. And then the largest, these are for the large, again, for the large natural gas engine, they can be as large as five millimeter. Okay. In terms of number of nozzles, I've seen four nozzles and the maximum that I've seen is 24. And then these nozzles, these tiny little holes, you know, there's very interesting arrangement for optimization of aerodynamics. Uh, they're angled, they could be angled, they could be layered. Um, next, I'm going to share with you uh, some of the results from my lab. Um, so if you look at, you know, fundamentally, you know, you have a hot jets, right, which are the combustion result from pre-chamber. Now penetrates into a fresh, unburned, cold mixture, right? So this is basically a turbulent jet problem. So to, to better understand the fundamental mechanism of, uh, of the jet ignition, we developed a single jet experiment. Um, so here, basically, uh, we designed a pre-chamber and the volume is about 1% of the main chamber. And then there's a spark plug and there's only one nozzle, which generates one single jet. And then because it's optical accessible, we can do visualization, high-speed imaging, quantitative measurement to understand how the properties of the jet correlates with the ignition outcome. Um, first of all, I want to show you uh, the ignition mechanisms. Uh, we, you know, we test different pre-chamber designs and then varying the orifice diameter, the nozzle diameter and pressure temperature of the environment. And we found that there are two ignition mechanisms. Uh, the first one is called jet ignition. Basically um, from the images we can see, we can determine that the jets is basically a jet made of hot combustion products. There are minimum active radicals, OH radicals. And this basic means when, you know, pre-chamber flame tried to pass through this tiny nozzle, you know, less than one millimeter, it got quenched. So what's coming out is just a hot product jet. So let me uh, play this simultaneous shiriran and OH chemiluminescence to show you. Let me play them together. So this is one single jet. This is the nozzle on the very top. Okay, they push some code gear. Now this is the jet, right? The jet's coming out and then ignition takes place over here and then expand it. Okay, I'm gonna show you another, which we call flame ignition because we found a lot of OH radicals when the jet's coming out. 
which means that when the flame passed through this tiny nozzle, it was survived. Um, it, you still have the flame front with active radicals. So this is perhaps a more um, a better illustration. So when the jets started coming out from the orifices, in the left case, we see appreciable OH signals. But on the right hand side, uh, there's no signal until sometime later, uh, this is downstream here, downstream of the jet, ignition start to happen and then propagate upward, downward, and left and right, like expanding. And also from the pressure measurement we see for flame ignition that the main chamber pressure rise quickly, right? Because ignition burning uh, immediately took place. But for jet ignition, there's a considerable delay. That means the jets keep penetrating. And then after some time, perhaps when the environment, which is damn cooler number, uh, is appropriate, and then ignition takes place, that we observe the pressure rise of main chamber like there's a delay. So this is essentially you know, a fundamental problem. What happens when a flame try to pass a small nozzle, right? A small channel orifice. Uh, you know, this has been studied a lot in literature. We know when a flame trying to pass through a small channel, there's heat loss to walls, there could be radical quenching, and there's also highly stretched because, um, you know, these jet speed are very high, could be a few, meet, a few hundred meters per second. Um, so these flame from a highly stretched, which can also cause extinction. So really the question is, you know, the flame will be able to uh, survive or quench depends on all these factors, right? Stretch rate, heat loss, radical quenching. Now, what we found was uh, if we increase nozzle diameter and we observe more jet ignition, and that you can explain that, you know, when flame tried to pass a smaller uh, or if smaller nozzle, um, there's higher stretch rate and high heat loss rate, which makes extinction more likely to happen. Uh, another thing is that if we increase pressure and we find that flame ignition tends to dominate, we tend to find more OH signals out of the jets, uh, in the jets out of the pre-chamber. I guess this, you can use uh, the quenching distance concept to explain it, because uh, quenching distance decreases with pressure. So for the same diameter, you know, whereas pressure increases, the flame able to su survive had a better chance um, if pressure um, increases. Uh, I want to play a video that's just for fun because we observe when uh, when natural gas or hydrogen operates a very lean condition. In this case, the phi equal to 0 0.25 for hydrogen, that combustion instability start to show. You see the flame, the jet, uh, the jet flame start to oscillate. Um, and that's the instability and lean burn conditions that we will need to address. Um, so uh, next, I'm going to talk about our engine rig. So basically, uh, we, you know, our collaborators said, well, the single jet experiments very helpful. You have quantitative measurement that can help us to validate CFD or monitoring result. But we really want something to be close to an engine, so that will be more helpful in terms of uh, pre-chamber design and optimization. So we develop an engine rig. Uh, this is not really optical engine because, because, let me see, sorry. Sorry about that. So this is, a, a, the, the whole setup is based on a GM four cylinder uh, a gasoline engine, but we only uh, activated one cylinder, okay? And then we modified the cylinder. We installed optical windows from sides and the bottom so we can visualize the jet. We also fix the piston. So it's not moving piston, fixed piston because we want focus on the jet penetration, the formation and ignition processes. So this is about the setup. 
I would like to uh, show you a couple of movies um, to give you an idea, you know, the jet process, uh, which obviously depends on, you know, how you design the pre-chamber. So again, um, because we don't have a dyno, uh, the, this is a real engine configuration that the inlet exhaust valves are uh, operated by electric motor. So I want to show you the jet formation, um, penetration, ignition processes, and I'm going to use two pre-chambers. So the left one, as you can see, so this is the pre-chamber volume. Okay, this is about 1.2 percent of the clear, clear clearance volume. Um, this pre-chamber has on the bottom, you see it has six holes uh, with a nozzle diameter one millimeter. Okay, the total area, so the total area basically means like the number of orifice, the number of nozzles time uh, the area of each nozzle. Okay, um, the volume is about 1.2, uh, 1,210 uh, cubic millimeter. This is the V to A ratio. Again, V to A ratio is a very important design parameter for pre-chamber optimization. So there are about a few cycles uh, in the movie. So you see uh, six jets coming out and then ignite the mixture and then keep burning uh, the main charge. So this is the first cycle. Uh, as I said, there are multiple cycles. This is a, another cycle. You see one of the jets seems to ignite uh, earlier than the other jets. A third cycle, again, this jets, these two jets seems to be more dominant than the others. Okay, this is the last cycle. And then on the bottom are the pressure, uh, pressure history data. And you can see, um, you know, each curve represents one cycle. There's uh, some cycle to cycle variations, which I'll explain a little later. Now, next, I'm going to show you the uh, jet processes for a different pre-chamber. So all the parameters are the same between these two. The only difference is that, is that I have 10 nozzles. So you see there are 10 nozzles on the bottom of the pre-chamber. Uh, so the total area increased, uh, volume and other thing, other parameters, including geometry of the pre-chamber are the same. So see, uh, that's 10 jets coming out, pretty uniform on this cycle. Uh, another cycle comes in. You see, uh, in this case, these two jets seems to be, uh, you know, occur later. A third cycle.
All right. Um, so with this um, visualization of the jets and measurement of pressure, so that help us to correlate the, <clears throat> the jet patterns with the uh, main chamber combustion process, such as, you know, burn rate and cycle to cycle variation and so on. So, so from these uh, videos, we observe, you know, some cases, you know, depending how many nozzles you have, you know, ideally, if you say I design a pre-chamber with six nozzles, you would like to have, you know, strong jets coming out of all six nozzles, right, and then quickly spreads penetrates into the main chamber. But things is not always like that. So we observe that sometimes um, you have the jets more uniform, uh, you know, in terms of performance. Other times, like one or a few jets dominates, the other jets just disappeared. Um, so here, I want to give you an example. Um, this is a pre-chamber with four nozzles. Uh, the first video is, you know, where you're going to see the jets are more or less equally distributed. Oh, what's going on? Can you see the movie? No. Okay, it's coming. So this is what I call evenly distributed four jets. You know, the four jets are more or less uh, symmetric. Okay. All right. Let me show you the second one in the middle where I, you know, find it's uh, unevenly distributed, which means some jets are igniting earlier than the other jets, and then they quickly uh, penetrate and occupy the, the main chamber. Okay, can you see the middle movie? So it looks like the top and right one uh, ignited the mixture earlier than the other two jets. Again. Okay, uh, on the right hand side, it seems I'm having a little trouble with these videos, but nevertheless, on the right hand side, you see three jets. That means there's one jet coming out, but then it's kind of died. Um, this is the on the far right. You see the three jets, top, bottom, left, but the right jet disappeared. Okay, so the question really is, what determines the number of jets that coming out from these are, uh, uh, nozzles? And what are the property of the jets? For sure, we know the property of the jets, such as the velocity, turbulent kinetic energy, and temperature, and you know, a dissipation rate. Those are all responsible for the outcome, which is ignition and flame propagation, right? But the question here is that ideally, we would like to have as many jets as possible uh, coming out, and then each of the jets would be able to ignite and then quickly consume the main charge. So what are, um, what determines the number of jets? So we did some simulations using Converge. Um, the conclusion is that the key factors are pre-chamber lambda and EGR distribution, okay? Which means the average lambda and EGR level are important, but the distributions are equally important, if not more. So I wanna show you two cases. The top one are, you know, the lambda distribution, just pay attention to the pre-chamber, which is in the middle. Um, lambda temperature and also isotemperature contours. So the left two are a side view, and then on the right are bottom view. Um, the top three videos are for a smaller uh, nozzle, which has a diameter 1.2 millimeter. And the bottom one is a larger uh, orifice, 1.4 millimeter. Okay, let me play this. 
Okay, hopefully you can see the movie. So you see the lambda distribution. Lambda is very, very high, which means ling, um, on this right side. That's why you don't see the jets coming out, right? You see the three jets on, um, you know, from the bottom view, that's top left and right, uh, down, um, but not the right jets because the lambda in the, near that orifice region is very lean, okay? So it could not burn to cause a flame to propagate through that nozzle. Uh, let me... Okay, now the bottom one, see if my mouse works. Okay, the bottom one looks like it's uh, it's playing now, the movie. Um, so again, you see that the jets uh, start coming out from the right. Uh, and the left one actually, we did not see a jet. Again, that's related to the local lambda uh, in the nearby region of each um, nozzle. Okay. Now, next couple of slides, I want to share with you some of the engine testing result, which is very promising. Uh, I hope that you will get excited about these. Uh, again, these results from my collaborator, Dr. Yu from Aramco. So they did a engine testing uh, of pre-chambers. So basically, um, on the left uh, side, you see the shows uh, the chamber pressure and then different pressure between pre-chamber and main chamber for three orifices, uh, 0.75 D, that's the 0.75 millimeter, that's the size of the nozzle. Uh, you know, the three pre-chambers have six, eight, and 10 holes, okay? And then the baseline is the spark ignition uh, for comparison purposes. So if you look at the... Um, the different pressure as well as apparent heat release profiles, um, you know, for smaller, <clears throat> for smaller nozzles, and obviously, I'm sorry about that. Um, for smaller nozzles, the green line, you always see there's bigger delta P, right? Because, you know, you know, the, the gas passes through smaller area that the velocity is the, the velocity is higher, and then the pressure difference is higher. Now, in terms of the heat release rate, it's obvious all three pre-chambers uh, burn, ha have higher burn rate. Um, the dashed brown line, which is the baseline, okay? So TJI offers higher burn rate and reduced uh, combustion variability, which is on the right-hand side, Again, this shows the uh, combustion variability is about 3% for passive pre-chamber, uh, whereas it's about 5% for spark ignition at lambda uh, below 1.6. Now the bottom one shows the COV uh, and NOx level for passive and active pre-chambers. One significant finding is that if you look at this bottom three curves, those are gases, um, gases active pre-chamber. Basically, they injected methane um, as a fuel to the pre-chamber, okay, active pre-chamber. So this can push the link limit, the lambda value from typically 1.7, 1.8, now to above two. Okay, so they can TJI can improve the lim limit to above two. And if you look at the NOx uh, emission, it's less than half grams uh, per kilowatt hour. Uh, this is another engine testing result. Uh, on the bottom left uh, figure, uh, summarize you know, the engine platform and the ignition system. So the first three spark plug over here, and then the two green ones are passive pre-chamber and active pre-chamber. So just from this summary um, diagram, you can see the efficiency increased uh, by 2.5% from the blue and by another 6% from the light green using <clears throat> active pre-chambers. So again, from these maps, uh, testing passive and active pre-chambers, you can see 
um, knock limit extended using passive pre-chamber with externally cooled EGR, and then lin limit extended between uh, lambda equal 1.7 to 2 using gases. Here it's methane uh, active pre-chambers. So these results are very promising. Um, basically, passive pre-chambers can achieve a third a 13% increase in efficiency, and active pre-chambers can achieve about 20%, nearly 20% uh, use methane as a gases active pre-chamber uh, using uh, ultralink combustion. All right. Um, so, so I've uh, described some promising engine testing results of uh, active, both active and passive pre-chambers. Next, I want to talk about challenges of simulating <clears throat> pre-chamber ignition engines. Um, we, we often hear from our collaborators and colleagues um, in industry, you know, um, many of them use converge simulations. Um, um, it's, it's hard to match engine testing results with simulations. And, uh, you know, this has caused us to really think about, you know, when you add a pre-chamber to a gasoline engine or, you know, a large bore natural gas engine, what really happens to the combustion mode? So here I have the, uh, the famous Bogie peters diagram. I know everybody is very familiar with this. Uh, this diagram is in log log forum. So you see the whole area is uh, divided into different zones, you know, the, because the physics are different uh, in terms of the combustion uh, mode. For example, laminar flames, and then on the right hand side, wrinkled flames, corrugated flame lit. So here is basically, you know, uh, flame lit. And then all the way to second wrinkled flame, second flame, and then eventually thick flame. Uh, this is the region we used to call broken reaction zone. Uh, anyway, um, you can see for SI, uh, spark ignition operation, it's here. This is the brown area. So mostly uh, the condition falls into corrugated flameless zone. Now with dilution, which could be air dilution, which means lean or ultra lean operation, uh, you see this blue curve. Um, and also with EGR dilution, the black curve. So basically uh, the mode moves from corrugated flameless zone to second wrinkle flame, okay? Now, when we simulate um, pre-chamber ignition engines, we have to consider two additional uh, processes. One is the process, combustion process in the pre-chamber, right? The other is, you know, when the jet's coming out, right, it quickly ignites and then uh, it's basically, it's a turbulent jet combustion. We have to consider those two. So I want to show you uh, where those two processes fall into in the Borgi diagram. So this is where the pre-chamber combustion, uh, it has overlap with SI operation, but more significantly is the turbulent jet combustion. So from, for gasoline engines, it most likely into two regimes, thickened wrinkled flames, as well as sickened flames. Uh, for natural gas engines, because of the much higher operating pressure, it's very likely that those jet combustion may fall into the thick flame zone. So I hope by this you're clear about the challenges of simulating, you know, which turbulent combustion model are you gonna use because you have different processes within the same engine that falls into different zones, right? Can we use flamelet model? Well, if the jet combustion is in the thick flame zone, that's not gonna be accurate, right? And some use sage models um, that really not, uh, good enough, I would say, uh, for highly turbulent jet combustion, uh, unless, you know, parameters needs to be tuned. Okay. All right. This is my last slide. Uh, I would like to share with you, um, 
In terms of pre-chamber jet ignition, uh, we found there are two ignition mechanisms. Um, if you ask me, you know, do you know an engine which mechanism, you know, for gasoline engine or for natural gas engine? My answer is no, because it depends on your design of the pre-chamber, like how many or if it, nozzles, the size of the uh, a nozzle and then operating temperature and pressure and so on. But one thing is for sure is that the in terms of turbulent kinetic energy, the jet contains much, much higher turbulent kinetic energy than the flow in the pre-chamber and then the flow in the main chamber. And these kinetic energy self-induced, okay? And because of that, the jet ignition and combustion, you know, when the jet comes out, that process may fall into the thick flame zone or second flame zone. Um, however, most combustion devices operate in the thin reaction zone. So this makes monitoring these processes very challenging. Um, now, engine testing results have given very promising results. Uh, I have reported to you, you know, pre-chamber TGI can increase dilution tolerance and also mitigate knock due to fast end gas consumption. Engine testing show the efficiency can be increased by 13% for passive pre-chamber and nearly 20% for active pre-chambers. At the same time, we have to realize, have to understand there are several challenges of uh, pre-chamber technologies. For passive pre-chamber, uh, unstable combustion, you know, misfire, a low load condition could be an issue. Uh, and also passive pre-chamber has very limited, uh, uh, limited lean or EGR dilution tolerance. Now, active pre-chamber can, you know, better uh, tolerate lean burn or EGR dilution, uh, as I showed earlier, but it requires a booster system, right? It's more complex, it adds more cost uh, to the manufacturing process. And if you want to use jet, uh, if you want to use gasoline as the uh, additional fuel, uh, fueling process, that means um, you know, inside is such a small volume, a few cc, uh, you need to break up gasoline and vaporize gasoline. The whole process is just very difficult, very challenging. Uh, if you use gases, um, say as methane, um, that's easier, but again, you're going to have a different fuel system on board. Uh, it also may require lean after treatment. Okay. All right. That's my last slide. I'll thank you for your attention. I'll be happy to answer your questions.